Hi, welcome to a lecture on maximum gain beamforming. So the starting point for this lecture will be an array of the type shown here. Shown as a surface array, but really that's not a restriction on this analysis. In general, we're talking about any array for which the excitation can be described as a volumetric current distribution with all the currents oriented in the z hat direction. Current moments given by I sub n delta L, where n enumerates the current moments. And then a spatial sampling function where P sub n is indicating the element positions. And n goes from 0 to big N minus 1 for a total of big N current moments. Now recall that setting I sub n equal to I sub naught, that is, making all the current moments equal in magnitude and phase results in a broadside pointing beam with maximum directivity, that is maximum gain. So now the question is how to choose I sub n's for maximum gain in any specified direction. So in other words, we already know the solution for broadside pointing. Now what's the solution for a beam which points in this direction, theta naught, phi naught? Well, Recall that directivity should be proportional to the uh, square of the array factor. So under the conditions described above, maximizing the magnitude of the array factor accomplishes this. Now the array factor is given by this expression, the sum over the elements, and then this uh, phase function which describes the geometry of the array. And recall that r hat, as usual, is a unit vector which points from the origin to the field point. So it has x, y, and z components as given by this expression. And first, note that we might as well make all the magnitudes equal to 1. So a constraint in this analysis will be that the magnitudes are all 1. Just to elaborate on this a bit, note that making the magnitudes either greater than 1 or less than 1, but all the same, that's merely an increase or decrease in the total radiated power, and that's not going to change the directivity. Letting the magnitudes vary with n, well, that's an interesting idea, but we'll return to that idea later. So, requiring that the magnitudes all be 1, and that only the phase of the magnitudes can vary, this gives us phase-only beam forming. So this is the condition under which we are going to determine the excitations that give us maximum gain. The magnitude of the array factor will be maximized when each term of the series, which defines the array factor, has the same phase. And the phase that we want is the one that corresponds to the pointing direction. So the I sub n's should be given by this expression, because this will make each term in the series, which defines the array factor, equal to 1. They'll all add in phase and we'll get the maximum array factor. So this is summarized mathematically here. The array factor will be given by this expression, and each one of the terms in the series will be 1, so that the array factor will be n, and that's the maximum value it can have, again, under the conditions established above. To calculate the pattern, we follow the usual steps. First, we determine the array factor. The normalized pattern function is the array factor times the element pattern, that's pattern multiplication. And then because it's a normalized pattern function, we divide by the numerator evaluated at whatever direction gives us the maximum value. And we've already determined that the denominator then will be n. And then normally this is plotted as a power pattern, and that's just 10 log 10 of the magnitude of the normalized pattern function squared. And that's in uh, dB or dBi, either way. Okay, so now an experiment to demonstrate this. We have a 10 by 10 array of z hat directed current moments in the yz plane, which means we have 100 elements or 100 current moments. 0 0.5 wavelength spacing, which is a common value to choose, but certainly not exclusive. Note that broadside of the array is the x-axis, the plus x-axis, so that's theta equals pi over 2, v equals 0. The h-plane is then the xy-plane, that's z equals 0. And the e-plane is phi equals phi 0. 
and here we're just going to let phi zero uh, equal zero for broadside pointing. So theta naught equals pi over two, phi naught equals zero. The H plane looks like this. We see a half power beam width of uh, 10 degrees. We see minus 13 dB side lobes because this array is uniformly excited. In other words, that minus 13 dB side lobe level is the one anticipated by Fourier transform theory because the array is essentially a rectangular window. In the E plane, we have half power beam width of about 10 degrees, but I will point out that that's not exactly the same as a half power beam width in the H plane. They are slightly different. In fact, you can see also that the side lobe level drops very slightly by half a dB or so, and the side lobes roll off faster than they do in the H plane. And that's because of the element pattern, the sine theta factor, which is contributed by the fact that the elements are current moments. And they have nulls in the plus or minus z hat direction. So that accounts for the change in the E plane relative to the H plane. We could also anticipate the half power beam width using Fourier transform concepts. In other words, we don't have to necessarily go through the work here of plotting the pattern to anticipate what the half power beam width is going to be. There are, in fact, some very good approximate methods for doing this. And um, to see this, we'll use the Fourier transform. So just recall in the time and frequency domains, the way this works is that if you have a pulse in the time domain and the width of the pulse is t, then what you see in the frequency domain is a sync function. And the width of that sync function, the half power width of that sync function, is 2 pi over t. That's something in radians per second. Here, in the space domain, we have a rectangular aperture. We have that in both dimensions. We have that in both of the rectangular cross-sections through the uh, aperture. So we expect the pattern to look something like a sync function. And the half power width of the main lobe should be 2 pi over d, d being the width of the aperture. So here, the half power beam width is, by analogy, 2 pi over d in radians per meter. Now, half power beam width is not in radians per meter, it's in radians or degrees. So we divide by the phase propagation constant to get something having units of angle, that is, radians per meter divided by the units of phase propagation constant, which are 1 over meters, gives us radians. So half power beam width is 2 pi over d divided by beta. That gives us 2 pi over 2 pi over lambda times d, which gives us just lambda by d. So generalizing for a uniformly excited aperture with the D broadside pointing, we expect the half power beam width to be about lambda by D radians. Or you could say one over the width of the aperture in wavelengths. Now in the experiment above, we had 10 elements with half wavelength spacing. So D is 4.5 wavelengths. So following the formula, we expect the half power beam width to be 0.22 radians, which is 12.6 degrees. And what we observed was about 10 degrees. We're not expecting the results to be equal because in one case we have a sampled aperture, in this case we have a continuous aperture. But we expect them to be pretty close, and in fact they are. Now, if we scan in the E plane, we move that beam over to 30 degrees. Now the H plane looks like this, where here is the main lobe, and here's 30 degrees. Now the half power beam width is 12 degrees. That's a slight increase. The side lobe level is minus 13 dB still. The reason it's still minus 13 dB is because to steer the beam, we only had to change the phases. And changing the phases across the aperture doesn't change it from being a uniformly excited aperture. If we continue to scan now over to 60 degrees, the beam is pointing over here at plus 60 degrees. The side lobe level, the highest normal side lobe level, is minus 13 dB, but we see this thing creeping up. And that's an emerging alias, or grading lobe, as an antenna person would refer to it. This will become an equal second lobe of the array once the pointing reaches pi over 2. 
In other words, what's happening here is that as pointing moves from broadside towards end fire, well, end fire will end up with this beam here, but the same phases add up to a lobe which points in the other direction. And that's an alias with respect to the geometry of the array. So that's what's happening over here. Now, if we were to do the same experiment, except scanning in the H plane and plotting the E plane patterns, we would see the analogous behavior. So to wrap up this lecture, just one more idea, and that's that here we did phase-only beam forming. So what happens if we keep the phases of I sub n that we have experimented with above, but allow the magnitudes to vary across the aperture? So again, Fourier transform theory tells us what to expect. Varying the magnitude of a window changes the width of the main lobe and the height of the side lobes. So this is one, not the only, but one technique for doing pattern synthesis. If we want to change the width of the lobe, if we want to change the side lobes, then we would vary the magnitudes. And that leads to one technique for pattern synthesis. That concludes this lecture on maximum gain beamforming.